Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Bill Arning, director of the Contemporary Art Museum Houston. Bill has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Contemporary art in Houston is really interesting. You, you're in dialogue with, with three other museums and other, and other cultural institutions throughout the city. Talk about how you stage contemporary art in a city like Houston. Well, the model I'm using is Los Angeles in the 70s because this is a great city to base art careers out of. It's becoming an art capital. Uh, I describe it as what Berlin was 20 years ago or LA in the 70s. Artists for most of post-war art history in Texas who started getting attention from the outside world would immediately leave and go to LA or New York. Now, when young artists like Jeremy Duprez get major galleries around the world, they buy buildings. And they realize this is a place they can base a career out of. That fundamentally changes the role of Contemporary Arts Museum Houston as the non-collecting Kunsthalle for the city. Because we get to be edgier or take more chances. So when we have an artist like Susie Rose Marin, who's been based there for her whole career with major galleries in other cities, who remains a major player in the field, we can give them the type of intellectual attention, curatorial scholarship, and help keep the city more vibrant. So we also, when we bring an artist in like Angel Otero, whose retrospective is opening with us uh, December of 16, we have a community there that is consists of both collectors, patrons, but also art makers and young people. One of the things that inspires me is I'll be traveling through my active schedule in the art world and I will run into someone who I didn't know was born and raised in Houston. And they tell me that going to the CAM when they were 15 and 16 changed their idea of what art in life was. We're a free admission museum, we are walking distance from one of the great art high schools in America. And I love the fact that we get to bring this and trigger future cultures and make the ongoing cultural life of the region better. It's in a really um, rich soil to be telling people about what's happening in global arts. One of the things that I find so fascinating about the Kunsthalle uh, idea, which sometimes is viewed pejoratively, is that you have a situation in which the building is not a star at all. In many museums, the building is a star and then the art is hung within the building, is situated within the building. And that context is interactive. Whereas in the Kunsthalle uh, process, the Kunsthalle really, it recedes into the background, the building is reshaped, repainted, recolored, reorganized in order to embrace the, the art and, and really becomes simply the infrastructure, but the art is the star. The building was designed in the early 70s as, um, as a shed for art, a metal shed. It looks, it's made of corrugated metal, which was an industrial building technique. And it is an unusual uh, geometric shape, and it's got a very strong sculptural presence. One of the things that everyone mentions in talking about the cam, as we call it, uh, is that it's hard to find the front door. Um, it is. Visitors come and they're leaving the Museum of Fine Arts, which is directly across the street with its iconic Miss Van der Rohe building. And then they, uh, they see the cam and they're like, oh, I should go there. That looks like an art space. And then they walk right past the front door. Some give up. Uh, and we know that that's always a risk. One of the great gifts of our building is that it is um, fully reconfigurable. It is got no permanent interior walls at all. Uh, and it allows for incredible flexibility. Curators love working there because of that. There's very little we can't do. How do you decide what you're going to do with it? There, there are so many contemporary artists, so many artists who are worthy as the years go on and, and, and the environment in, in the United States changes, what people are thinking about, what people are obsessed with, 
uh, evolves. How do you decide what actually inhabits that building? Well, Houston is also one of the most diverse cities in America. And we have um, a very celebrated curator, Valerie Cassell Oliver is our senior curator, and she is considered the foremost expert on contemporary African American art in America. And she has been our chief curator for a number of years. That is very helpful in a city that is as diverse as Houston. Um, when the foundation representatives come to visit us, they say, we see that your audience looks more like the city of Houston than most museums do. But we actually get an audience that looks like our city. And that is an amazing thing to see. We also have a very young city. Uh, people move there because it's a very good city to make money in. The city has understood if they're going to get top quality business people moving there, they need to invest heavily in arts and culture. So the job of a museum like the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston in that city is very different than what museums with the word contemporary in the title are where they're the only game in town. Right. And they have the responsibility for showing the local audience who Matthew Barney is or who any of the sort of marquee names are. We don't have to do that. Most of those people have been there early in their careers at one of the institutions. So we get to be more provocative and um, take more chances. So as, as you look at your board, you, you inherited a board, but then you've also helped to shape the board over the last years. When I got there, a lot of the board had been there through a lot of ups and downs. So <clears throat> the, hiring me was their um, get out of jail free card that they basically were like, okay, we got a director in place, we can go now. So a lot of it was getting new people involved. And I have kept most of the long-term trustees, the ones who had been there before me on different advisory committees so that I still have their deep historical knowledge of the museum and the culture of the city. But one of the uh, biggest parts of my job is getting new people involved. Right. And when I am trying to get them energized about what it means, like there's a, a really grand woman named Nancy Allen in Texas, and she's now the chairman of the board of Age of Society of Texas, and that's her deep passion. Her son, Eddie Allen, has been on our board, is now on the Manil board. Um, she has an incredible collection. We were doing uh, a donor event at her house, and she gave a speech, and she said, the reason I got a collection like this is because I got involved in the CAM board, and they would take me to things I would say I would buy from there. And she goes, if you want, to have a collection like this one day, get involved in the cam. And I'm like, Nancy, can I just video this and put it everywhere I need to go? Because <laughs> it's such a good uh, public service event. Public service right event. Yeah. And there's and you know, and also I can promise them a very good time too, and that they go to these things. I personally work a lot on the donor trips because I can always make sure they're fun and I'm always trying to find places that none of them have ever been before. So um, last year we did Des Moines and Omaha, which are about an hour and a half away from each other. And Des Moines Art Center is one of the great museums and people don't think to like make a, I'm gonna have a weekend in, in Des Moines. Des Moines. And I do know that the donor trips, the success of, their, of the donor's memory is only half art, the other one is the restaurants. And Omaha happens to be one of the great eating cities and it's got this James Beard restaurant called Grey Plume. Uh, we collaborated with Art Is, the Israeli art group, and we took a group to Tel Aviv. and. Artists was able to get them to meet the great Israeli artists who are in their 60s to 80s now. And they saw that this part of the world, and that was one of the best trips we'd ever done. And they, these are these kind of legendary names from Israeli art history, and they're like walking into the studios. It was a, a fascinating time. What's next for the uh, Contemporary Art Museum? Um, we have some very big building issues that are domina dominating my thoughts right now. Um, Mickey Klein, an amazing philanthropist now based in Austin, uh, when he was in Houston, got us for our offices, this 1961 psychiatrist office that was next door. That building is now on its last legs, so we've got to get that fixed. So we, because we're thinking about this real nuts and bolts stuff, we're looking at what we need to, do, to fulfill the, 
the requirements of CAM for the future. Um, we currently have, because we're one big room, essentially, if we have a show with sensitive artworks, we can't use the space for performance, I liked, I mean, I know the best way to get young people through the door is to get rock bands and DJs into the space. We don't have, we can do that sometimes. Like Lower Dens, one of the great uh, alternative bands who were from Houston originally, we got to, got to play there last year. But we had to do it between shows when there was no art on the walls. We need a mixed use space. And um, since building a new office building is not exactly sexy for a donor, but building a new theater mixed use space is, we have a some sort of scale capital campaign on the corner to build a space that can bring the young people in and get the excitement through the door. Bill Arning, thank you so much for exposing the Contemporary Art Museum Houston uh, in this venue. Yeah. And thank you so much for your insights. And everyone watching, please come. Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely.